The scripture today is actually a prayer. And I want us to read this prayer in light of everything that's been going on in our nation recently. I want us to read it in light of what happened in Charlottesville, the light of what's been happening in our communities, in light of all of the deportations that are happening. We're not hearing much about them, but they're happening. And I just want us to read this prayer knowing that this was a prayer of David, a prayer that he prayed when he was in need, but also of his trust in God in all of this. Turn my volume down just a little bit uh, on my microphone, if you will, Mike. Psalm 86, a prayer of David. And I can tell I'm going to be reading a very different version that's up there. That's the NRSV. I'm going to be reading from the NIV. But that's all right. I think you'll be able to follow along. Hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in steadfast love to all who call you. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. I am in distress. I call to you because you answer me. Among the gods there is none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Show your strength in behalf of your servant. Save me because I serve you just as my mother did. Give me a sign of your goodness that my enemies may see it and be put to shame. For you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. If you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. These were Heather Heyer's words, her last Facebook post. Heather Heyer is the 32-year-old paralegal who has a passion for social justice who was run down and murdered last Saturday in Charlottesville. Nineteen others were also injured in this terrorism attack by a white supremacist, Alex Fields. And on two separate days, President Donald Trump blames the violence on coming from many sides. If you are not outraged, you are not paying attention. Republican Senator Lindsey Graham from South Carolina spoke out saying, Mr. President, I encourage you to try to bring us together as a nation after this horrific event in Charlottesville. 
Your words are dividing Americans, not healing them. Graham continues. Through his statements yesterday, President Trump took a step backward by again suggesting there is a moral equivalency between the white supremacist neo-Nazis and KKK members who attended the Charlottesville rally and people like Heather Heyer. I, along with many others, do not endorse this moral equivalency. Another Graham, Franklin Graham, eldest son of Billy Graham, spoke out in support of the president, agreeing that the blame for the violence in Charlottesville should lie on many sides. Franklin Graham said, they want to blame Donald J. Trump for everything. Really, this boils down to evil in people's hearts. Satan is behind it all. He wants division. He wants unrest. He wants violence and hatred. He's the enemy of peace and unity. I denounce bigotry and racism of every form, be it black, white, or any other. My prayer is that our nation will come together. We are stronger together and our answers lie in turning to God. All I can say is, Lord, have mercy. I know Satan is behind the violence in Charlottesville. And every good Christian knows that we are all sinners. But please, Mr. Graham, Sometimes evil manifests itself outside of our hearts and on the streets. Sometimes evil walks out in the streets and we have to stand up and say no. The president's refusal to lay blame squarely on the evil that invaded Charlottesville has only emboldened that evil. David Duke, former KKK leader and participant in that rally, said this rally represents the fulfillment of Donald Trump's promises. Mr. Graham, by endorsing the president's weak condemnation of the rally organizers, you are deflecting the president from condemning evil, seeking repentance, and you are even hindering the president's own salvation. And Mr. Graham, you are also deflecting this nation, especially those conservative white evangelicals that follow you, from identifying and resisting evil when it manifests itself in our presence. On Judgment Day, Mr. Graham, you are going to have to answer for the souls that did not enter into the kingdom of God because you gave them an excuse to stay lukewarm. When you were baptized, all of us here, when we joined Rising Hope, we made a vow. We made a vow, and these are the baptismal vows of every United Methodist, and a lot of other churches have very similar vows. You were asked to renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, to reject the evil powers of this world and to repent of your sin. And furthermore, when you joined, you were asked to accept the freedom and power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever form they present themselves. 
What more are we waiting for before we will stand up and live into our baptismal vows? A battalion of Nazis, KKK, and white supremacists are walking the streets of America proudly proclaiming their racist ideology. Many were in paramilitary uniforms carrying loaded <coughs> weapons, including assault rifles, and they were chanting things like, Jews will not replace us, blood and soil, and sink Heil as they passed in front of the community synagogue. Nazi flags, Confederate flags, and other symbols of white supremacy were carried everywhere. And the groups that were organizing this rally to protest the removal of Robert E. Lee's statue were very public in their white supremacist goals. Many interviewed made it clear that they want a white nation, a nation cleared of minorities and people of color. This is pure evil. And the President of the United States has the gall to say that the violence that many have come, that the, the, the violence that may have come from the resistance to this e evil is equally to blame. Come on, Mr. President. Equally to blame. And then he only steps deeper into his own, steps deeper into it. He says that many good people were there on both sides. No, Mr. President. No. There may have been good people who opposed the removal of the statue of Robert E. Lee. But any good people who turned out to support that cause at that rally would have left in a heartbeat when they saw the grotesque gathering of Nazis, KKK, and white supremacists. Many of my clergy colleagues were there presenting a counter-protest Friends from college and, and seminary and, and many clergy from across the Virginia Conference of the Methodist Church. Even our district superintendent was there. And they boldly proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. They counted the cost. And they willingly entered into the conflict with a presence of deep abiding love. Saturday morning, they marched silently through the city wearing stoles and clergy collars. They walked past many white supremacists and paramilitary armed with assault rifles. Uh, what unfolded was a dramatic opposition. Was a dramatic in its opposition. Insults, threats were hurled at these ministers as they knelt and, and, and prayed at the edge of Emancipation Park. But the gospel was clear as the clergy chanted, Love has, love has, love has already won. Then their witness broke into a spontaneous rendition of this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. There are some times when our faith in Christ calls us to step up and to step out in resistance to evil. We may feel as poor and needy as the author of today's psalm. We may cry out to God for mercy in our distress, but we who are 
faithful servants in Jesus Christ, we've been given some perks. God has given those who seek to follow Him as a loving God some special gifts that help us in every situation. And today's psalm outlined what those perks, what those gifts are. First and foremost, we have God's steadfast love. Verse 5 tells us that, that God is good and forgiving and abounding in steadfast love. We can sometimes in our language mean many things by the word love. Uh, I once heard a person say, I love everybody. Some I love to be around, some I love to avoid, and others I would love to punch in the face. But God's love is not fleeting. God's love is not dependent upon emotions. God's love is steadfast. God's love is consistent. God's love is unwavering. God's love is based on God's character. And it expresses itself in generosity, in faithfulness, and in mercy. It does not seek to exclude others, but always seeks to include others. Another perk that we receive when we serve this God of steadfast love is strength. In verse 16, the psalmist writes, Turn and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant. How many of you have ever said to yourselves, There is no way I'm going to make it through this day under my own strength. Maybe you're exhausted because you didn't have a good night's sleep. Maybe you have so many demands that are coming after you. Things seem confusing and overwhelming. Maybe the, the kids are screaming. Your spouse needs help. The, the boss wants to call you to come in early. Your phone is ringing. Uh, you get a letter that you forgot to pay a bill, etc., etc., etc. So many things can make us come to the point where I need strength to get through this day to deal with this. These are just minor things. What if we had been in the crowd that day with Heather Heyer when that car plowed her down? God always gives strength. Let me say it again. God always gives strength. If we are serving a God of steadfast love, God always gives strength. And one of the ways that God gives strength is through another servant perk, the fact that God answers prayer. In verse 17, we read, In the day of my trouble I call upon you, for you will answer me. So what does it mean for God to answer our prayers? I don't know about you, but, but sometimes I can feel incompetent when I pray. I mean, you know, I ask myself sometimes, is my heart really in the right place to be praying right now? You know, I ask myself, am I praying for the right thing? And sometimes I wonder, am I really connecting to God? Does God really hear what I'm saying? No matter what you feel about praying, it is important that each of us do it. It's important that we do it to the best of our ability and on a regular and daily basis. When we pray, no matter how we feel about it, things will start to happen. 
a process of transformation begins. One theologian said that, that prayer is, is, is like the scattered parts of our lives being drawn together in a unified place and for a unified purpose. And she gave the example of iron filings and a magnet. And the best way I can explain it, did you ever have one of those clown faces as a kid and underneath these clown faces covered in plastic there were iron filings and on the bottom of the, 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 the cardboard you, there were, you, you took a magnet and you right. could use the iron filings to make a mustache or a beard or eyebrows or right. something like that. Iron filings are attracted to that magnet. And the, this theologian says that, um, that the iron filings being attracted to the mark magnet is a, is a way we begin to understand what happens in prayer. All of the parts of our lives are being pulled to one place. All of the parts of our lives are beginning to move in the same direction. And suddenly we see all the parts of our life that are vibrantly connected to one another. And we see that we are really beginning to get connected to God. And in so doing that, we are beginning to be connected to the entire world. And then we begin to see and know this world in a very different way. We begin to realize with God's help, we can be the change that God wants to see in the world. We can be the change that God wants to see in this world. That's a true answer to prayer. Another servant perk is teachings about the, the truth. In verse 11, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Some of you may have heard of Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles. Homeboy Industries is a ministry that, that takes many gang members out of these violent gangs in, in these violent communities and moves them back into a life in the mainstream. They teach the truth of the rewards of a life in Christ. And by teaching that, they are beginning to make a difference. Now usually, there's no exit from a gang, except by death. You know, the only major exception to uh, an exit through the morgue is sometimes an exit strategy that is a conversion to Jesus Christ. Something about the gangs <coughs> seem to respect a true conversion. Father Greg, who runs Homeboy Industries, understand that gang members also know about loyalty to one another and loyalty to a purpose that's bigger than themselves. So he brings them the truth of Christ, offering them hope, training, and job skills. He brings them and helps them see another kind of of loyalty. He has moved thousands of people out of gangs and into a life with Christ. Because these gang members are used to a life of discipline, once they get it with Christ, they are disciplined. They are disciplined about their life in Christ. And they find the rewards of being in a life with Christ. Every year, Homeboy Industries 
employs 280 people in their community, but they have brought thousands, literally thousands, to Christ and a new way of life. The question we need to be asking ourselves is, are our lives teaching the truth about Christ? Does how we live show the world who Christ really is? Who are you teaching about life in Christ? And where are you doing that, making a difference in somebody's life? Finally, God offers the servant perk of help and comfort. In verse 17, we read, You, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. When Jesus spoke to his disciples the night before he was his own death, he promised them that the Holy Spirit would come to them. In John 14, 16, he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. The word advocate in Greek is paraclete. And paraclete is also a word that can be translated as helper or comforter. It conveys a meaning uh, also of coming alongside get sick of someone. Coming alongside to, to help. Coming alongside to, to lend aid and comfort. So those who are seeking to serve our loving God are promised that the Holy Spirit will come alongside them. Those who seek to serve a loving God are promised that God's Spirit will walk with them, bring them help and comfort. We are never alone. When we face the challenges of life, if we are really seeking to serve God, we are never alone. The Holy Spirit will always be with us, be beside us, and work through us as we seek to do God's will. Resisting evil, resisting injustice, resisting oppression, are an important part of doing God's will. Through it all, we are promised God's steadfast love, God's strength, God's answer to prayer, the teachings of God's truth, and the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to end my message today with a prayer for a torn nation. This prayer was printed in Sojourner's Magazine on the Sojourner website. And I think it's, it speaks to what's going on in the world today, in our nation today. Jesus, somewhere between us and them, you're holding together the least of these. Somewhere completely outside of all of this, you are ushering in a kingdom not of this world, one that rights all wrongs and rules in love. But for now, here we are. Here there are so many bodies, black and native bodies, Brown and white bodies, lifeless bodies, bodies with torches, bodies kneeling in prayer. And you, with your resurrected body, stand over us, clasping shalom in your hands, weeping once again for Eve, because you have seen the path chartered by brokenness. It led you to the cross, and in your mighty grace, it led you back out of the cave you were buried in. It led us through greed 
genocide and colonialism, through slavery, through war after war after war after war, until today, we realize that we are still buried in tombs of hate. Oh God, we are buried now. Our tombs mark what side we are on and who, we're, who we are for and against. And our bodies are longing to come alive again. You watched our story unfold from the beginning. Our hate staining our hearts. Our moments of selfless love paving the way for justice. You've shown us that an upside down kingdom has no place in an upright world based on privilege, prejudice, and supremacy. You, Jesus, the table turner, you were not afraid to shout shalom from the streets or find God in the quiet of an afternoon. You know that to, you know that to gear up for the hard work meant listening, listening intently to the voice of God. You knew that the hard work would lead to unbearable circumstances that people would divide themselves over you, that war would come. Today, Jesus, we are divided. We are torn. Today, we are writhing in our bodies, our black, native, brown, white bodies. And we cannot hold in the kingdom when it's asking to be made known in the lives of people the world deems worthless let me read that again we cannot hold in the kingdom when it is asking to be made known in the lives of people the world deems worthless So root out these original sins. Root out injustice, the kind that beckoned you to come from other places to our world in the womb of young Mary. Root out supremacy, the kind that puts one brother beneath another brother or one sister beneath the weight of patriarchy. Root out hatred, the hatred that devours the head and the heart and clouds our understanding. Oh, Jesus, we are so clouded. Jesus, be the Jesus we read about and be the Jesus we've never known. Stories of the Jesus of deep time, deep love, deep shalom. Oh, Jesus, we need you. Unite in full grace all that is divided. Mend in full love all that is torn. Resurrect us, we pray.